Okay, welcome to the 33rd episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Bruce Parry. Bruce is an English documentarian, Indigenous rights advocate, author, explorer, trek leader, and former Royal Marines commando officer. His documentary series for the BBC called uh, Tribe, Amazon, and Arctic have shown him exploring extreme environments, living with remote indigenous peoples and highlighting many of the important issues being faced on the environmental front line. He directed and produced the amazing film Tawai in 2017, which explores the different ways that humans relate to nature and how this influences the way we create our societies. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Piers. Yeah, really. Yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to me today uh, and my audience. Um, I would, yeah, love for you to be begin with just sharing a little bit about your, your journey, you know, what brought you, <laughs> and, and it can be as long or as short. Can't. Well, there's, I definitely won't make it the long version, because that, <laughs> that would take up all our time. Um, yeah, well, um, as we were speaking before, before we press record, you know, we, we have slightly similar backgrounds and we have military parenting. Um, I came from a military family, uh, British, went to boarding school, which I think we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, very Christian, very um, orthodox and, uh, and sort of institutional sort of background and uh, had pretty happy childhood as far as I remember. Um, and uh, I anyway, joined the Marines at the age of 18, mostly because I didn't want to go to university uh, because of family issues, really. Uh, and that became my new sort of formative influence in life. Did that for five and a half, six years. Became a physical training instructor in the Marines. Loved it. Just had, you know, was just fully dived into that world um, for all <laughs> the complexities that it later brought me. Um, uh, then quit that, or more likely was kicked out, really, uh, and uh, went to university to do P in sport, quit that early, um, got a job leading expeditions, mm -hmm. which became my sort of new direction. So I spent a number of years then taking uh, people on expeditions to Asia, working with orangutans and turtles and, and rhino and uh, tiger and all sorts of things out in mm -hmm. Borneo, Sumatra, Sulawesi, Saran, Ambon, all that part of the world, amazing, but probably the best job I ever did. And that, as you could imagine, you're getting taste now of like, okay, that was the seeds of what then became my later career. Mm -hmm. um, I quit that um, after a few years uh, and then um, got, uh, then I sort of uh, had a wayward year of, undoing beginning to undo all of the, 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 the my military and previous and sort of institutional past and had an awakening and came back and took a year out and went to festivals and started meeting people that I would never normally have met and started healing and, and basically started a spiritual and healing journey uh, thanks mostly to an amazing girlfriend um, and then that sent me off in a different tra trajectory. Then I got into the film industry, worked for there for a few years, um, and then quit that. I did. I, I realised I've said quit that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was quite. I just basically changed careers for various reasons quite a few times, so not knowing what you know, choosing things that are completely different, and you're thinking, oh my god, I've got such a spectrum of life experiences now I'm not specialist to anything this is going to be really difficult for me to find any work and then finally I sort of landed this job with the with the BBC I went off to climb a mountain and for millennium and took a camera and that did really well one worlds around the world and so I kind of got picked up by the BBC and then realized oh my god all of these different mm -hmm. skill sets that seem so disparate actually all fitted in into this one new career then that I took off in which was um, doing expeditions and um, and documentaries for the BBC which which I then did for a decade or so 
li living mostly with, you know, the, the things I was best known for was living with indigenous peoples around the world. And then I did um, a, a series on climate change. I did a series on globalization. Uh, and then I quit <laughs> once again, the BBC, um, and then spent the next 10 years making my own uh, independent feature documentary for cinema, which, uh, which you mentioned there to why. Um, which came out in 2017. And, um, and then since then, I've been trying to bring all of these sort of like global experiences into fruition in my life by trying to be in a place, live more simply, get into community, all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's a medium version of, uh, <laughs> of, my, uh, of my, how I got to where I am here in Wales, looking out the window at a green, green forest. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. It sounds like a, a really fascinating journey. I tell you what, it, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Yeah, um, I, I feel incredibly privileged. Um, and, and things just got better and better and better. I just was on this like crest of a wave for many, many years, many years. Uh, that, you know, there's been peaks and troughs uh, for sure. But uh, and and there's complications that come with all these great blessings yeah. that that you that gain a greater awareness of your impact on the planet and all these mm -hmm. things and so that comes with it a responsibility and a sense of weight I guess mm -hmm. um, and um, and so that has its own impact too so for all these blessings there's also awarenesses that if one wants to be sensitive and aware in life, one has to actually look at and face and deal with. And so there's, there's a mix there, there's a mix. And uh, mostly though, I've been in a, an abject joy and pleasure and, <laughs> and fun and privilege. And then more recently, it's like waking up to, to trying to li li live a bit more humbly, <laughs> which is quite hard having had a life of joy and privilege. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, it's reading your journey and watching to why. Yeah, if people haven't watched it yet, please do go and watch uh, to why, because uh, I found it, yeah, very heart opening. Michelle, my wife, was watching it, I think it was a year ago. And I think that was then that I thought, oh, I'd love to speak to Bruce. And I think I looked up, you know, some of your, your background then. I'm like, ah, oh, I could see how some of the things crossed over. And yeah. watching to why it's like I really felt it. Really felt the film um, and your journey. And I could really resonate. So yeah, it's very Thank beautiful. You. Beautiful film. Thank you, mate. Yeah. It took a it, it was a it took its pound of flesh. It was a labor of love for sure. And and I made many mistakes. It was my first time directing, and I thought I could say all these things and realized in the end I couldn't. The website's got quite a lot of stuff that I didn't manage to get in. <laughs> that is, that is, that, is, that is, there's more it's because you know we were filmed in two continents that we didn't even get into the film. And so okay, a whole wow. bunch of stuff, layers of of things that um, I wanted to get at. So I'm still, um, yeah, and and it took me a while to come to terms with the film. I wasn't massively happy with it at first. I it was it was a very very difficult personal journey for me. Um, but I'm much, I'm in a much good, better place with it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated listening to one of your interviews with one of the producers, I think, of the, of Tawai. And you were talking about your journey with the Kogis and then going on that journey of renunciation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not in the film at all either. No. <laughs> that's, that's, that. that's a whole other second. I mean, there's so many layers. That was 10 years of like the deepest personal journey of which you get an hour and a half of snippets and, and the whole, whole tribes that we visited or indigenous groups like the Kogi who, who we went to visit who had a massive impact on my life that just aren't even, don't, don't even touch on in the film. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> loads of scientists yeah, we interviewed, loads of places we went. We went off to Africa, we drank ayahuasca, the whole group of people it cost tens of thousands to do all these things and they didn't even make it in. So you can see the madness that i was going through at the time <laughs> wow i'd love you to share a little bit about your journey with the kogis and the renunciation what what was your learning from that yeah crumbs um 
Well, for anyone who hasn't heard of the, the Kogi, the Kogi, uh, they're, they're, a, they're a, an ethnic group, indigenous group who live in Colombia in a place called the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is near the, the town of Sierra Nevada, of, of Santa Marta, which was the first place that the Spanish ever landed when they came to the Americas. Columbus didn't make it to the Americas. He, he was in Cuba, I think. And then, but the first Spaniards the following year made it, they were there. And at the time, there was a group of people called the Tyrona civilization that they cohabited with for about, I think about a couple of generations, 80 years or something. And then there was this big scrap and then they disappeared off into the mountains into this like massif, um, the Sierra Nevada, snow-capped peaks right by the Caribbean shore there and uh, sort of dense forest all around. And they basically have stayed there for the last 500 years. So that's, there's about four ethnic groups, three or four ethnic groups up there. Um, one of them and the best known one is called the Kogi. And they're kind of a curious group um, in many ways. There's a civilization, there's 30,000 of them, but they probably, they, they, it feels like they've done it, like made, created an intentional community almost, like from their time with the, from their time with the Spaniards, they clearly learned a lot, probably of not of what not to do. So then they <laughs> disappeared up and, and then they recreated like an intentional community, an intentional civilization, if you will, carrying some of their old traits from the Tyrona times and then mixing them. And so they've got this really interesting religion, really interesting spirituality, really interesting um, politics um, around um that this group of people that they call the Mamos, who are like the, the spiritual leaders. Um, and there's like 10% of the population of Mamos. Um, so it, you know, there'll be one or two in each community, each village. Um, and these people are chosen from birth mm -hmm. and they have certain roles throughout their life to be in charge of the clouds or the rivers, or there's a lot of ecology there. So these Mamos are given lifelong tasks, but they don't get any, um, they don't get any uh, special privileges. They're not like living in castles. And it's not like passed down the bloodline. And so it's always chosen for birth of different people. So it's like they've got this interesting, and, they, and but these are kind of like the spiritual leaders. So they make a lot of the decisions, but the, they make the decisions through divination rather than through their mind. This is how they say it. So they have little bowls with water and little pebbles with holes and they drop them in and watch how the bubbles come up and that's how they make their decisions together and so the populace see these these leaders as people who aren't getting sort of greedy and passing it all on to their sons they carry on doing the same work as everyone else they live in the hut the same size as everyone else and they make these decisions that don't seem to be about themselves that they seem to be coming from nature so somehow there's this sort of continuation of the, the the processes of decision making there that seems to have not got fraught and caught up in power and greed and hierarchy and accumulation and stuff so that's kind of curious and then these group these these people also have a very strong through this meditation that they do using these um well uh, they have a very strong meditative practice um and um, spiritual practice and some of these people are literally trained from birth for 18 years without even seeing the day daylight you've heard this but yeah I have, unbelievable yeah, yeah. yeah unbelievable so some not all some of them will you know so some will be chosen for doing various tasks but some will be in charge of actually looking after the connection to the mother herself and so they'll get taken away from birth. They nine years of meditative practices with, with limited um, visual stimulation where they're taught how to literally hear the voice of mother herself. She can't see anything, so it's all sensory deprivation. And then at the end, age of nine, they're given a choice of coming out or staying another nine years. Most of them stay another nine years. And so literally at the age of 18, coming out and seeing a bird and a tree and the grass and the mountains for the first time. Um, and these people are supposedly able to hear and connect deeply with the rhythms of the natural realm. And so this group, um, I'm this is a very long story, I know, but it is quite interesting. I hope you're okay with it. Uh, <laughs> I've heard and I've seen the Elder Brothers Warning, which is a film yeah. they produced, or they didn't produce. So I kind of, and I've read other people cover 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so Alan Herrera made that film, and it was Alan that invited me out. Wow. So this is 20 years after that first film, okay. um, Elder Brothers Warning. Um, they asked Alan if he would make another film, and it was at the same time that I was doing my tribe stuff and that I was also interested in making a film with the Coggy, and so we came together to go out and do one. And um, so we went back out and then I was invited because I, I was already beginning to come become interested in the spiritual aspect of stuff. I could see from my experiences with tribal people that a lot of my experiences of like Iboga or Ayahuasca or whatever weren't really the, the scientific explanation, the material science explanation of that didn't really answer to my experiences at all. And that there were these other experience, other sort of ways of understanding the world that were becoming more interesting to me. And so I was basically opening to questioning some of the material dogma of science and, and thinking about these other things. And consciousness was a huge part of that. What is consciousness? What is, you know, what is reality through, through the prism of consciousness? And, um, and clearly a group of people who have some of their elders, some of their leaders are trained in darkness and are able to literally commune with the, 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 the wholeness, the oneness of all, nature itself, or whatever you want to call it, was a curious group of people for me on my quest to go and meet. And so I was super interested to meet this group. And I wasn't like a dying, I hadn't become like a dying world hippie at all. I was still very much... A mainstream British guy, you know, who believed in science and all the rest of it. I, but I'd had these amazing experiences that opened me up, and I was definitely questing and questioning. Um, and so I was really keen to go meet these people. And um, and anyway, I go with Alan, and we have that whole week with them. And uh, um, and at the end of it, I'm like really blown away because they're like, okay, the the reason they chose Alan to make the film twenty years before. And we're talking about the 80s here was like that they were like okay they call us younger brother and themselves elder brother and they're like you younger brother i.e the rest of the world you are destroying the planet you're destroying the oceans you're destroying the forests we know because the mother's talking to us and this is long before the environmental movement kicked in so they were a curious bunch and i'd also seen on my own personal journeys how much humankind was destroying the planet and it wasn't really a big message out in the world at the time and so I was also very in alignment with this message. That I, that I believed these people had a strong message and where, however it is that they knew it, I believed in this message. So I was really keen to make this film with them. And I said to them at the end, how can I best prepare? And they're like, well, it's easy. Just give up sex, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, all of these things, because then you might be able to slowly get your mind into the right mindset so that we can that we can you can learn with us and they were like you know when we made the film 20 years ago we told you what we know but next we're going to show you how it is we know and so i'm like wow i'm going to be the guy that gets to unlock the secrets of this amazing group of people in the world that's um that's a that's a big old thing so i was really keen really really keen and so when they said give up all these things, I mean, like that was basically they would give up everything that was important to you at the time. So it's like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was like, what? No, no. And then I was like, hey, well, but why not? Give it a go. Um, and uh, and then I I came back, um, and in my head, even though I'd said to them yes, oh no, 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 this is the bit I forgot. Sorry, before I came back, what one of the people there are fixer uh, it might have even been alan but someone said to me well bruce now that you've said that you're gonna do this uh do, do this abstinence um you know they're gonna be watching you you know and i'm like well what do you mean they go well because they're the masters of meditation they're the masters of they have this thing called a luna which is the the, the spirit realm where where everything is in consciousness and only through and they have these things called poporos which got the the leaves and the and the, the they chew the coca leaf and then they have those crushed shells which gives them the calcium and then they like basically take a bit of calcium into their mouth to uh, activate the the coca leaf 
and then they rub this thing around and then they do all this meditation and it's like there's so many layers i could talk forever and i'm trying hard not to but there is a lot uh, anyway these guys are the masters of meditation and the they they believe that only through imagining something in the, in the finest detail in this realm of a lunar only then does it take shape in, in the material realm so it's very like um what uh a manifesting sort of like the new age understanding of manifestation is, is mm. relatively similar uh, which is why they're quite popular with a lot of hippies this this group mm. um and so um so some so someone said to me well you know that these are the masters of manifesting and masters of connection through this lunar space and if you deviate from your path of abstinence then they'll know and i'm like well you know maybe they'll read my body language when i get back but i'm not sure that i can imagine that they're manipulating the whole cosmos in order for me that, that just feels beyond where my understanding is i i don't not sure if i get that anyway so in my head i was like well i just started seeing someone and i thought oh i'm, I'm gonna at least have one physical moment with her before we we split up and so i come back and i and we do um and then literally the moment we finish my phone lights up and there's a text and it's from the producer saying oh there's a problem with alan and the bbc and we, there's there's real problems with the film and da 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 and then in my mind, I'm like, oh, my God, that's the, well, that's a, my first reaction is this is just clearly a coincidence. And then my second reaction is like, well, but th these are the this the, I've been told that this isn't coincidence. So like I'm now in a, in a struggle for my own reality in this moment. And then I'm like, OK, well, it's just coincidence. And then off I go to India to meditate and I go off and drink ayahuasca in the Himalayas and do a bunch of other stuff. And then I meet up with my girlfriend again in in delhi and we have another moment where i clearly transgress everything um and and then literally my phone turns on again it's like this time the film's off um and i just remember thinking in that moment it's like okay bruce you're the guy you've you've the, you've done this tribe series everyone thinks of you, of you as the guy that goes out i'm an advocate for indigenous rights and i'm like a real believer in their wisdom which i am all of those things but I realized in that moment, but you've also always maintained a, a certain amount of your own sort of superiority of mind when you've been visiting these people. You've always seen it with respect and with love, and you've definitely had deep healing experiences, but you've also thought, yeah, well, I kind of think we know better now. You know, some of this may be, I can listen to it respectfully, but I didn't necessarily buy into everything that I was hearing in all these places and then I just suddenly thought my god that's the, the strap line of my show is like one of the tribe and it's like well I'm clearly not one of the tribe and and I thought well how here I am in this moment now faced with this like crossroads of maintaining my own scientific material dogma of like this is the reality and that's just nonsense versus putting on the hat of thinking okay well maybe there is something in this maybe they are able to manifest maybe they are maybe my actions are having these like even my thoughts and everything are having these really real deep impacts into the fabric of the cosmos that's affecting way beyond just in the material realm um and so i did i thought well how arrogant of me why don't i just put that on i can always take it off again later and of course this is <laughs> where you wanted us to end with uh, with our with our chat because it's uh it's long, sorry it took me a long time to get here but undoubtedly everything shifted in that moment like everything was now full of gifts and every fr little frictional difficulty was still another gift that was just here to to offer me something and it's just like literally i was like on a conveyor belt through life just gifts landing in the out of the universe and like everything full of meaning every every single thing that happened was aligned with some layer of meaning and and for some years i abided in that space and it was one of the most joyous moments of my life actually um the story goes on and i won't continue it uh, unless you really want me to uh where 
all sorts of other things happen um, along that way. But for me, that was the most profound moment was like, there was just another step into realizing true wisdom of, of other ways of being and how, how closed I'd been um, up until that time. Mm. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. I could listen to you talk about the Kogis and all that for, uh, yeah, Kogis, yeah, for ages. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I They're quite of, something, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, one of my teachers a number of years ago, Drum, Drumvelo Melchizedek spent mm. quite a bit of time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, and wrote the book about uh, coming into the heart. I can't remember the exact name of the book, but I, I did his meditations for a number of years, mm. um, which is connecting to Mother Earth and Grandfather Sky, and then and then the Divine Child within. And yeah, I found it really beautiful for for yeah. connecting. Um, I guess how I would love to maybe transition this is to maybe to share some of your your experiences and maybe the contrast between your boarding life the military and then this wisdom this mm. illuman this you know the what we're taught is the way and listening to to why this idea almost like the left brain right this is right <laughs> So I'd love for you to, now that you've danced in both worlds, I'd love for you to share some, you know, your experiences. How was growing up? Mm. And then that visiting that other world? Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I'd love to do that. Um, well, that other world is one of many other worlds that I've that I've connected with and uh, while the spirit uh, the spirit path has been huge for me also the sort of political and sociological and all these other things have also been very very profound for me and my learning along the way but I think the most important aspect is this realm of healing is this realm of like trauma that we're all carrying individually and culturally um, and that these that we we're, we're, we're not really doing much about that um, whereas there's all these amazing tools that, that, that indigenous peoples have for, for, um, for healing and um, for, for relinquishing some of these traumas that we're carrying. And so I've been very privileged to have had a whole bunch of different versions of that along the way, um, um, which of every layer that's, that's removed allows you to realize what was what was there before whereas previously you might not have even known that it was a layer that needed to that, that needed to come away a layer of conditioning a layer of of, of, of um or some aspect of deep wounding because of course when i started out life you know i was a jack the lad sort of rugby playing you know all boys kid you know and like as far as if you ask me then like many others it's like well looking at yourself sort of sitting down navel gazing that what a waste of time that is there's no good that comes from that that's just nonsense it stops you know and i was a marine so it stopped being a dick you know stopping <laughs> fucking whatever it's like stop fucking around you know it's like life's for living and and actually there was a lot of joy in that you know i i was a very happy kid and although i had i didn't like and you know i have to be careful about this because i have a really lovely lovely relationship with my my parents and my family now but actually for many years as a kid I didn't enjoy home much you know weirdly you know I know one of your things is looking at boarding schools and stuff but actually boarding school for me was a complete joy because mm -hmm. it got me away from home mm -hmm. you know I loved it I hate it I remember my mum saying even at the age of nine she brought me in for my second second term with my trunks in the boot and dr driving down the the driveway to the boarding school and I literally opened the door and sprinted and I didn't even say goodbye and she had to unpack my trunks and everything and it's like I was gone it's like, <laughs> I didn't like home much I, I home in my family is very austere and my family are wonderful and loving and and I love them dearly now but I found it very hard I did find it hard um so boarding school for me was an escape it was actually much freer and for most of my friends there they were like well, they didn't like it because it was a constriction but for me it was the opposite so i guess that's just horses for courses but um often you don't realize 
what the problems are in life when you're that young you know you're just getting on with it and actually by and large I had a really good time I mean I was I was pretty stuck when it came to to women uh, girls um that there was an austerity again around no sex for marriage kind of attitude and pop music being the devil's music and all that sort of stuff which was kind of part of my family um life and so um and I think that that my um rest of my brothers and sisters didn't sort of experience that in the same way that I did, but I felt quite oppressed. And so school was an escape. Um, and then when I joined the Marines and I didn't want to go to university because I didn't want to be controlled by the finances of the family, which would have been controlling me. And I just wanted to be free of that, which is the main reason I didn't get, I, all my friends were going the UCA and PCAS or whatever it's called and off to university and there was like it was just super clear to me really early on it's like there's no way I'm doing that there's no way I'll finish my I could see if I fit if I get some A levels then at least I'll have an opportunity to get some work mm -hmm. but I'm not going to uni um and uh and and so actually joining the marines in a funny sort of way was like running away mm -hmm. uh, even though I came from a military family my dad sweetly never never pushed me in that direction but i loved i loved all the adventure training and stuff i was head of the ccf at school and these sorts of things and so and so i i really enjoyed and it was where i came alive most at schools through the kayaking and the rock climbing and the running around in the mud and stuff and so i kind of thought that was that boy's own stuff was going to be what the marines was like so i literally and I didn't think I'd ever get into the Marines. I thought I'd, I had a chance to get into the army, but like to get into the Marines felt like the most impossible possible thing, especially to get in the Marines as an officer. There's like tens of thousands of applicants for just a couple of, there's like 18, 18 slots that year or something. So it's like loads of, so it was very, it was, you know, it was pretty unlikely I was ever going to make it, but somehow I did. And then I joined up and then that became my new, formative experience which so i just became like i just adopted everything in the marines as if it was my new family which made me the worst of the worst the most bigoted racist sexist you know i was that guy i was just like the jack the lad of the marines you know which is like being on a big rugby tour so like horrendous and all my friends were then at university and i just joined into this thing and then like sort of like no one else in your world um matters because no one understands what it is you're going through um unlike the people you're going through with in marine training and so they just become your intensely close-knit new friendship group and everything else just falls away family friends every everything other than that girlfriends but they just all disappear and it's just like <laughs> about this group of people and then you just adopt and I remember when I first got there listening to all these people talking this weird language there's a huge like sort of like dialect going on in the Marines and I was like I'm not going to be like that but like within a few weeks there you are doing it it's like oh my god I'm, I'm not an individual I'm just part of this and there's something amazingly beautiful about that I mean it's a shame that that sense of camaraderie is is co-opted by a nation state to do all of its dirty bidding um, on behalf of all of us but uh, but actually, the feeling of being in that sense, in, in that group, all together with similar values, all clones of each other, is an amazing experience. You know, it's an amazing experience, and it's no surprise that people come out. You know, once a marine, always a marine, and people are still very close to their old friends and stuff, um, and never slag it off. So that was me. You know, I was in there for in that world and adopted it and absorbed it fully. For my whole time mm -hmm. and and then you do start a, a, a absorbing some of the prejudices you know students are idiots and you know and you've got opinions on different sectors of society different races and you're, you you suddenly start absorbing all these opinions and they just become your own and you don't care because you're just so supported and surrounded by like-minded souls and that's it you know so it took some undoing all of that you know and actually if i hadn't had amazing girlfriends and i think mushrooms psychedelic mushrooms mm -hmm. i probably wouldn't have 
because there's no need to undo it. You can continue to carry on with that mindset for a long time. You just find those. Well, most of my friends, when they left, they went to the city of London where you were. <laughs> and there you have it, you know, the bastion of male nonsense going on, you know, competition, aggression, sexism, racism. It's all there, you know, and like, um, and it's all cloaked with banter. It's cloaked with good, good fun and all the rest of it. But it's like it's it's dark as well. And there's a load of, and there's like you know the thing that you only realise when you start undoing these layers later in life is that actually quite often there's chaos in your life. You don't even realise it, but that you you're you're causing all sorts of mayhem mm. in your experience because you haven't you you're not de- you're not empathising. And so you're just barging through life at quite a strong, hectic rate, mm. causing all sorts of problems, which is all their fault, or it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. It's only when you start undoing these layers and coming into your heart space and realizing and feeling more deeply, you realize, oh my God, I was just the decisions I was making and the type of person I was and the, and the, um, yeah, and the sort of the, the impact I was having on others was really pretty harmful. And 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 it, you know, then you realize, oh God, the common denominator in all of my problems is me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's not it's easy to blame this person and there's that girlfriend or that girlfriend. It's like, but actually there it is once again, you know. And and until you start taking on board these healing modalities and realizing that, you know, you are at least. Uh, you know, some part of the blame in all of these things some part of it very often quite a large part of it but at least some part of it is you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there's and i see it even with friends today it's like they're so quick to just and I, I i had a girlfriend point out to me not not many years ago it's like Bruce, you're quite quite good at always saying it's that person that person it's like why don't you try just saying before you've even said anything about the other person I know that I'm part of this, mm. but there is this thing. And if, uh, but I always acknowledging that you are part of it. It was just, it's just even that is such a huge step in realizing that we are, you know, we're causing a lot of the chaos in our own lives. Mm. And so, yeah, for me, the healing began um, ultimately when I had a, when I fell madly in love. I did all those after leaving the Marines. If you remember, I said I went off and did all those expeditions in Asia. Mm-hmm. Still, I was mixing with non-military types, but because I was the leader, I was able to maintain my own sort of superior understanding, mm-hmm. sort of self, self-considered superior understanding. So I wasn't really threatened. And then I met a met an amazing amazing woman who um, I fell madly in love with, and then she took me off and we and we did a mushroom trip. And I had the most horrific mushroom trip. Um, but it, what it did was it just turned me upside down and spat me out. And it was like, okay, well, so that that's clearly <laughs> that's clearly not what you were thinking Christian values and what the, the, so, you know everything that because I was still probably you know, had, had my belief system was probably still quite Christian at the time. It's like, well, that doesn't fit. Mm. And then so, and then also see myself and, and then basically all of realizing that so many of my prejudices and everything were completely upside down. And then I went on this year of going to festivals and meeting hippies and taking drugs and going, Oh my God, these people I had these horrendous opinions of are actually kind of curious and interesting and they've got this thing called creativity that i didn't, didn't even know what that was and, <laughs> you know suddenly, <laughs> suddenly start undoing this mad constricted mindset that you'd had and then all my sort of old marine friends go when are you going to get a fucking job you loser you know da, da, da. and i'm like mate i don't want a job like you wearing a suit going to the sea i'm i'm going to a festival and fucking making daisy chains and having a great time and whatever you know fuck and then just realizing how how much i'd been constrained by this mindset and these and these wounds and and then as you go through um and it, it, this wasn't like a held healing at the time it wasn't like a, me going to see a shaman or a psychiatrist or any practitioner this is just me going on my own sort of 
slow, humble realization journey by mixing with people who have very different views to that which I had previously. Um, and just realizing how far out I've been with so much of my prejudices, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and in its own right, that ended up proving to be a, an immense blessing for when I finally got the job to make the films um, try. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, okay, well, I'm now going to go and talk to the world about meeting a group of people who maybe they're cannibals or something. And well, I can clearly come in there with this really strong view of this is bad. Mm -hmm. But like, I've already realized in my life just how far wrong, how far out I can be. So the best thing I can do is just shut the fuck up. Okay, beautiful. And then listen. Mm -hmm. And, And so in its own right, that one shift of me waking up to how 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 far out i'd been was was the sort of like the the breeding ground the starting point for me then going to meet these tribal people then of course each time i went to meet another group because i wasn't coming in with the judgment because i was listening first realizing oh my god there's something really valuable here oh my god there's something really valuable here oh my god i thought that i had an opinion of this but you're now showing me that actually i'm the one that's wrong about that and and uh, and that just carried on opening and opening and opening and opening as you can imagine and what an extraordinary journey that ended up being Mm. wow beautiful I love how you say that about just going in and listening because I feel I'm, I can see that with myself. Sometimes I can come in trying to fix a problem. Mm. And actually, if I just go into a situation and listen, the problem, there is no problem. It disappears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, I still, I still haven't mastered that in my own private life massively I, I still ha- am prone to judgment I am still prone to these things but what was really lovely is going when you go to a place that's so different and you've got a camera following you and so you're on you're on um, best behavior in a way is like that was the yeah that was the that was the modus operandi that I took on was like okay let's just go and listen and, and even though you might have private thoughts about something actually because you're in their house and listening to their stories and you're trying to figure it out before you come out with your own views, you sometimes realize, oh, wow, actually there's got a really good reason why they're doing that. And, and, mm-hmm. and actually when you look at it and we, and you just look at global events today or anything, it's like, we're so quick to point the finger and judge. You go, look out this crackpot doing this and forgetting that we did exactly the same thing just the other day, you know? And it's like, and we just can't, we, we, it's happening everywhere. It's mm. happening everywhere. We, we, we can't accept that we're actually also part of the problem. We do it individually and we do it culturally and it's happening right now. It's mm. like, it's mental how blinkered we are mm. uh, individually and, and culturally, societally. Mm. And it's like, wow, we are part of the problem. Really? We're part of the bloody problem. Yeah, I, I kind of heard this uh, saying recently that when we're pointing blame at someone, you've got three fingers pointing back. At you. <laughs> <laughs> that was really helpful. Yeah, I love that. I love when that. we're pointing blame, oh, it's that despot, and it's like, yeah. okay. Where and then you know, and then you obviously, when you get more adept at this and realizing, okay, yeah, I'm part of this. I'm part of this, and then then something really triggers you mm-hmm. and you know what i mean by trigger where you've got a very an extra energy drive of like of something that's much more so i mean i can be talking about people dying in other parts of the world and and think that's terrible but i'm not i don't get triggered in the same way but you know when something is really really triggers you you get that sense of like oh, whatever it is that feeling and and we can then realize, okay, cool, that's an amazing gift. I This is an opportunity because I know that when I get that feeling, mm. there's a big part of me that I haven't seen yet that's involved in this. You know, it's like there's a part, either I'm jealous or I'm actually doing exactly the same thing, but in a slightly different way, or there's some, this, this, this energy that I have, which is really excessively involved in my sort of opinion of that is, 
is something that I have to, it's all about me. It's actually nothing about that. It's all about me. It's weird how the subconscious works. It's like, wow, it's like, okay, this is me just angry at myself. And I noticed it when I, when I first sort of like, you know, I did the tribe series and I went down the Amazon looking at globalization and came back and was aware of like just how impactful our lives are on the rest of the planet. And, and so I went through that same journey of sort of like, of, of, shouting and screaming and wanting to tell everyone and I realized only later that I was just doing the same I was just basically shouting at myself because I hadn't made the changes in my own life and I see that with a lot of these activist movements as well it's like there's a sort of like rightful indignation which is valid and fair but it, the excessive anger is coming because actually we're not living ourselves yet we haven't seen that we're also part of the problem we it's not about pointing the finger and blaming it's like how how can we solve this not that you're wrong and how you can you it's like how are we because i'm in, in this as well how are we going to be able to do this and, and it's there for so many aspects of life if we're especially when we get these triggers the triggers are actually amazing gifts and mm. and i've uh, i mean i still get them all the time but i'm like wow okay what I, the first thing is like, okay that's really interesting what where is that where, where 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 do i look for that what what was that you know and sometimes i still can't find it it's like oh, God, i don't know but i know there's part of me that's involved in this yeah it's really and you know, the, the, and then the skill is to catch it before you act from it you know that's the important bit is to see if you can actually not be acting while you're in that place of being triggered and that's the skill, which I haven't mastered fully, but it's definitely better than it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd love maybe to kind of transition into a little bit about maybe community living. This idea, because when I lived in, <clears throat> so post the city for me, I went to live in a Buddhist monastery and I just went for 10 days. So I was celibate for 10 days and that came three and a half years. And my greatest teacher were these monks I was living with who were annoying me so much. It was like they didn't wash up or didn't do that. And realizing, oh, yeah, I've got to start looking to, to me. And I think my understanding at one point, which was a big change, well, I was so controlling when I got to that point that I let go of getting my own way. It was like, oh, beautiful. So I'd love for you to share something just about community. So this idea of how do we transition from this old way that most of us have been living into maybe more community based or like Buckminster Fuller don't said, you know, I think you mentioned that in the film to why, you know, stop looking at trying to fix the problem, but create a new solution and work mm. towards that, you know, what what can we do from your experiences? Well, there's so many things that I learned on my times with Indigenous peoples that were um, not happening in my life and not happening in very much in our society, but that would be really helpful for us going forwards. And, and it kind of, I got to a place where I was like, oh my God, you know, we, we're just so successful at creating exactly the type of society that we want, mm -hmm. but it's actually not the right society. It's not a society that's good for us. It's what we want, but it's actually terrible for us. It's like we've just, we've managed to create this, this chocolate factory and it's killing us. Yeah. And it tastes great, but it's just fucking killing us and it's killing everything. And like, it's a disaster. And it's really hard to figure your way out of that because you're gorging yourself on this stuff and all dying of diabetes. And it's like, what the fuck? Excuse my language. What are we going to do? And like... And it struck me that, as we've touched on already, that, that the big part of this is healing. You know, it's like we've got to heal. And, and that's really difficult. And so for me, I sort of realized, okay, there's a number of things. Well, firstly, I've got to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But there's a number of things that um, if, if we're all going to try and find a way through here, we've got to, like, you've got to inspire others to do the same. We've got to figure out how we're going to do this together. Mm -hmm. and so for me the first step was awareness and as a filmmaker I guess that was always going to be the case but it was like knowing myself and the journey that I've been on that early marine guy he wouldn't have even 
listened to anyone say, look inside, because there was no reason to. Um, and also it, the prevailing thought processes, the prevailing paradigm didn't say that was a good thing and all the rest of it. So how do you make, how do you even persuade someone to even bother wanting to before everyone's reached like rock bottom, you know, which hopefully won't happen. But that's normally when people have to wake, have a wake up is when they like literally crash out. But we haven't got time for that. And we also don't want that to happen. So we've got to find a way of actually inspiring people to go on that journey. Because as we know, that first step into the personal inquiry is a really complex one. And normally what happens when you lift that lid off your own subconscious is like there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes up. And it's also no surprise that actually some of the most pained people in our society, the ones who are struggling the most, have the worst stuff to deal with and so like it's really really hard it was hard enough for you and me to go on this journey with whatever it is that we had to see but we've got nothing compared to a vast majority of people especially in our society more so than other places who are dealing with a whole bunch of layers and layers of trauma that are just really 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 difficult so how are we going to inspire people to even go on that journey and that's hard you know and uh and the best way well you can go to therapists and all the rest of it but actually often that doesn't really get to the root of it, it stays in a mental space a lot of this stuff is needs to be somatically healed it needs to be brought up mm -hmm. and so that's really difficult well i think that for me it was like the first step is we've got to know that it's a journey worth going on mm -hmm. you know and this whole area around um uh the sort of belief system we have in society at the moment that it's, it's just that uh don't go looking inside it's just some people are just born like that this sort of sort of everything is genetically predispositioned or you know there's some people are just bad and all the rest of it it's like that's the prevailing thought pattern mm -hmm. and yet i've been to visit in tribal people where there's no violence at all yeah. literally any form of violence is considered to be a type of mental illness mm -hmm. that's like unbelievable it's like where's the axis of evil there where's the genetically just bad person there it's not the case this is a societal thing and so when you take on board or when you can share the narrative that actually this is a societal thing that the environment is key and that actually we can heal there is something that's more beautiful on the other side if we're willing to go and look for it that to me is the narrative that has to come out it's like we have to believe that there's something beautiful that we can achieve together and that means that we do have to go on this journey together and that journey inquire it requires looking inside and don't worry there's tools there's techniques there's methodologies there's healing modalities that can help us with that mm -hmm. but the best way to do that is in community you know the best way to do that is with people who can give you the aftercare and support and structure and all the rest of it so we need to heal but that means coming back together you know, and this is what I was saying earlier about how it is that we've created this society that's so is what we want, but it's no good for us is because we create a society where we don't need to be in community. We don't need to have our stuff reflected back to us. It's like I don't with the money system and all the rest of it. I, you know, the more successful I am, the less I need to care or think about anyone at all. Yeah. You know, the more money I have, I just. I don't have to have any anyone that, that tells me I'm being a dick that day mm -hmm. or that wants to support me because my behavior is, you know, most of us are looking up to the people with more money. So it's like, or the more fame or the more uh, beauty or the more goods, all these things that are basically allowing us to become more and more atomized mm -hmm. and, and it's killing us. And actually coming back together, especially coming back together in our sort of layers of strata as well, where we're not we're not seeing each other as more powerful and that we, we, we have the capacity to actually speak directly to each other and say no mate that's that's not working that's not that's not right behavior it's like that we then you start realizing oh yeah my behavior is actually problematic and then there's if it's done well there's there's structures that we can go on to to, to heal you know but that means that we've got to come back together and, and, the, and the other thing about coming back together that was really clear to me that being in community um, is a way for us to stop some of these traumas happening in the first place. It's like, it was really clear to me that growing up, 
the tra indigenous peoples who are bringing kids up in communities that were having many less traumas than we are in ours. It's like when you've got the closed doors and a nuclear family and the mum and dad are having a difficult time, which we always do, you know, little Jane and Jimmy are just going to, they're sponges, they're going to absorb that. No matter how much we try and hide it from them, they, they will receive it. And like, whereas if you live in a tribe, they will just go next door. You know, they just go, they're just like, the doors aren't there. They just go play. And there's, because there's other people in the area who have shared values that you don't need to restrict. Oh, you can only go there for two o'clock. And it's like, no, there's a flow that the kids, kids don't want to be with their parents. Kids just want to play with each other. And so to create a space where the kids have a, a, a vent out for when the parents are having problems, that those things aren't just passed directly on. Because that's what's happening to us. It's just that we're getting into generational traumas that are compounding and compounding. And we need to break down those walls so that the kids can have the ability to not have that comp compaction of all these traumas getting passed on and passed on. And so to me, it was really clear if I was going to have kids, they, the, the biggest learning I could have is that the greatest gift I could give them was to do that in community so they just wouldn't really receive all the nonsense that I would otherwise pass on unknowingly, you know, half the time. So having space and then also being with nature and all this stuff, but then having people around who you trust and love because they have shared values, mm. you know, it's like, obviously we all are in community, but if you're in community with people you don't really know very well and who, who have very different value sets to you, it's much harder for you to just open your door and let your kids run free with their kids, et cetera. So that's really difficult, which is why I, I've been interested in the sort of starting something where, we created a, a value set and allowed that to be sort of shared out and seen and, and, and held. But within that community, there's other things that I learned from my time of tribal people. It's like, you know, well, communities are also problematic. You know, the, there's lots of issues, mostly around power in communities. So how do I learn from the tribes as well? Well, most tribes have chiefs, have shamans, they have their own power struggles. But actually there were one or two tribes that I visited, who one of them you saw in the film to why, that don't have these power struggles. And they, to me, were the really interesting ones. These were the pre-agricultural um, instant return nomadic hunter-gatherers, the egalitarian groups, where they work at every level at all times to avoid anyone accumulating or showing off or anything that suggests that they are taking more power than anyone else. And that's, that's a constant work within their group. And that means that the, the group is much more harmonized, which, of course, will also mean that the kids within that group are much more harmonized. Mm -hmm. And so for me, they were the big, big lessons. It's like, OK, coming back into community, a certain type of community with shared values and and and, and no hierarchy and and sort of shared ownership and all of these things, shared decision making was was a huge step that could potentially occur that would allow for the next generation to have less trauma um, and you know I won't see the results of this this is going to be two or three generations down the road that you might get to a place where people are coming through without the levels of trauma that we have where they can truly empathize with each other and with nature and feel what it is that we're doing to the planet and all the rest of it you know and it may be that it's not going to happen in time I don't know but like it felt that waking up to the, the 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 waking up to where we're at and the problems that we're pouring on each other and our environment needs you know obviously is is, is vital to happen now and like we all we can all think oh yeah isn't it terrible but like but we've got to feel it and in order to feel it, you've got to be in your body and you've got to heal and all this stuff. So it all, it all comes together. Um, and uh, if we don't feel it, then we're, we're not going to get through. You know, it's, to me, it's as simple as that. And we can all conceptualize this sort of technological fix, but it's just not going to do it because nature's bigger than any of us. And so, we're, you know, we've got to feel it. And that means we've got to heal and we've got to get back to each other and into nature and so but that that's 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 going to be quite a trip and i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not sure you know i'm struggling with that even though it's really clear to me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but uh yeah so that's kind of why i feel strongly about community 
um, mm -hmm. if I if I didn't care, if I if I didn't want to have kids, which I, I may or may not, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a spring chicken for sure. But like, uh, then I wouldn't worry about. It. I'd just go and go go to the bar and watch the ship sink like everyone else, you know. <laughs> But actually, I think there's a chance we can turn the boat around. So that's what I'm interested in doing. Well, thank you. That's really inspiring. And, you know, please, if I can support in any way, then please do let me know. Um, you know, I've been involved in different communities. One's Menfest down in um, the south of England that we've been meeting the last few years, 150 men on the land. You know, it's just for four days, but it's been really great. We've had some really difficult conversations two years ago with Black Lives Matter and then about, you know, sexuality. And it's just having that space where everyone shares. Mm -hmm. And I find on social media where we're disconnected, there can be a lot of anger or, you know, judgments. Whereas in circle, sitting in a TP or sitting around a fire, I've really noticed that community. And that being able to for us just to share. Uh, and I love what you say about how we often put people on pedestals. And I've found that as soon as I hear someone's stories, it's, it's a real leveler. They suffer just like me. They've been through real, you know, difficult times. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for for your vision. With that. Yeah. I guess, you know, we've probably got, say, an, another 20 minutes or so. I mean, I could talk about many things. I mean, one of the things which comes to me is I noticed on your YouTube uh, page, you'd shared the Kin School um, and the Techos. And interestingly, I had a connection to them about seven years ago. I was traveling down to Lamas Project. I was talking to a friend and I was like, I'd, I'd read the story of Kin School and I was, I'd written to um, the head teacher and I wanted to go and visit. So I was relearning Russian. And she said to me, well, why don't we just invite one of the teachers to, to England, to, to the UK? I'm like, oh, so she, my friend got on with that and they invited um, uh, Leonid Sharashkin, who's the editor for the Ringing Cedars series. And he came to uh, CAT to the Center for Alternative Technology and did a workshop there. Um, How long ago was that? That was amazing. There was people came from all over the world for this wow. workshop. Um, and he basically taught, you know, what they were, you know, because he'd spent a bit of time, his daughter had studied there. Mm. Uh, and then he had worked as a teacher there for a bit of time. Um, and I noticed you had shared something. So have you visited the Kin School? No, no, I was just super inspired by it. I, to be honest, I'd forgotten that I'd shared it. it, it okay. I don't really use my YouTube very much. But like, um, yeah, I just remember seeing it a long time ago. I mean, schooling, as you've heard, I'm, I'm interested in you know, how we're going to help our kids get through. And uh, one of the big things for me, I mean, I, I'm here in Wales and it's like a big draw. It's like, you know, if I was going to have a community here and there's a group of kids growing up, it's like, it's a big thing. It's like, you should put them into the local school because that's that's the prevailing mindset in a place like this. It's like, in order to really be, be to be respectful to the culture that's here, we need to join in. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm like, Crumbs, that's a really big question for me because mm -hmm. actually... What I see, even though I've got so much respect for the for the world culture, and there's so much that, that, that as an English person, I'm like in, in torment about being here because of, you know there's a whole bunch of stuff that's that's very real here about the English Welsh story, and the first thing I should do, like I did with the tribe, is come here and listen before I come out with my own views, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, um, there's so much that's similar between our two nations that I'm like, no, I don't want to send my kids to, to a school that has at the heart of it, everyone's sitting in rows listening and uh, obedience and, mm -hmm. and all of that sort of stuff. It's like what I've learned with the, with the, um, with the tribes that I'm most interested in, in learning from was that um, there's no coercion. 
you know, that there's no um, hierarchy and, and this, and, you know, when you think about how much as a nation, we're quick to just fall into step and listen to our lords and overlords or whatever, you know, leaders, whatever you want to call them, and like almost want and ask for guidance. And it's like, so much of this is coming, I see, from our schooling. And it's like, because that's how we're taught, you know, we're taught to just shut up and obey. And, and that's what I knew from the Marines. And yet there's this other, I wonder what it would be like to have a more democratic type of schooling. Mm -hmm. And that's what this, this school that I saw in Russia, and I know that there's two in the UK and that there's others around who are exploring this sort of like pupil led, you know, the, the word educate, educare Greek, is to bring out you know and what we're doing is we're pouring in and so this whole thing is slightly inverted which is what i see with so much of of, of all of our society actually is it's kind of on its head and and that doesn't mean to say that i have an issue with anyone who's going to a normal school or any parent who needs to say that all of those things it's like it's totally of course it's what it is it's what it is I and mean, we're all doing the best we can we're all doing the best we can but having had the experiences that i've had i find it really hard not to try and bring into into my life somehow some of what i consider to be the wisdom of other ways of doing things and like i don't know that i'm right and i you know this, these are big human experiments but I was fascinated with the success of that type of schooling that was happening in Russia and that I've heard happens here in the UK. And it's complex, you know, it's like we're, we're not living in isolation, you know, we're, we're, we are part of the wider society that we have to love and respect and listen to as well. But like, but that doesn't mean to say that there can't be good new ideas, that there, there can't be insights from the past, the recent past and the distant past that, that that we should be looking at right now because let's face it the society and this, the way of being that we have here and on the planet isn't working for us mm -hmm. we've got to have new ideas mm -hmm. and here are some new ideas you know from my experience it's like we existed for 95 percent of our time on the planet in a certain way mm -hmm. and it's ever since that got out of hand as things have gone awry and what was it? Well, it was because we didn't get into the game of power and hierarchy. Yeah. That's the single biggest shift that I believe has happened in the last 10, 15, 20,000 years. You know, it's like that is why we're in this game. You know, it's like when you're living with a group of people and you'll have and co-own and everything, you're not out to try and get the next thing to show show my status and that whole game about doing the Joneses isn't there. And when you're living in deep connection with everyone, you don't have those same addictions where you're filling that empty, that hungry ghost, empty void with all of those addictions. I mean, this has been sh clearly shown now that addiction is related to connection, mm. you know, and it's like when you're in those spaces of being in connection and you're not having to try and see yourself, where am I in my status in relation to each other, my status through possessions and all these things, then actually you can put your time and energy towards enjoying your time <laughs> playing with your friends rather than showing off who you are to get the prettier girl or whatever it is that is your motivating factor it's like those things just disseminate because we're all in it together and so for me it's like well here's a simple not simple but here is a part of the journey towards trying to harmonize society and our relationship with nature in this endless cycle of consumption and actually we could be happier. You know, the last words to my film, To Wives, like the, the guy around, he says, look, I don't know about planes or cars, but if they don't last forever, I don't want them. Unlike the forest, which lasts till the end of time. And then I'm like, okay, that's not because he doesn't think planes and cars are cool. Of course he does, but he also, but he thinks his meaning in life comes from something else. His meaning in life doesn't come from his own the trinkets that he can get from us and it's like the self-enjoyment his meaning in life comes from the future of his children and the generations to come and and therefore he's not making a sacrifice by saying he doesn't want planes and cars he's actually he doesn't want them as much as he wants the forest and that's the difference his meaning is where he's placed his meaning is in something greater than himself and we've got it the other way around 
all of our meaning in life is for my own self-worth, my own needs, my own, and like, and we need to flip that upside down. And the best way to do that is by coming back together again. It's like, we've got to come into harmony with each other. And we've got to explore, we've got to really question this game of hierarchy that we're in because it's, it's at the heart, it's at the heart of the stress. There's this great, if you look at my website, why.earth, there's a section that I think says next, which is that we've got interviewed a bunch of scientists. They didn't make it into the film. There's one guy there called Richard Wilkinson. And you listen to him and he gives the most amazing interview with me about how actually the, 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 at the heart of nearly all of the problems in nearly all the societies around the world is inequality. It's like, he goes, you look at, you look at all of these stats and he's taking stats that the governments themselves have put out. You know, this is UN stats and IMF stats or whatever. It's like, look at health, heart disease, cancers, look at antisocial behavior disorders, look at violence, look at every statistic across the board. And then you put them onto a graph and you look at the rich nations and the poor nations and it doesn't do anything. It's like, it's not related to whether or not you're rich or not. It's related to how you perceive yourself to be rich. It's look, then you put those same stats in a graph of inequality within societies and there's a clear line. And the, and, the, and the societies with the, the most amount of inequality have all of the problems there. And the ones with the least inequality have the least of those problems. And there it is, you know, and you see it everywhere. And you see it, I've seen it in these societies. Is it, it's not being poor is an indicator of bad health. It's feeling poor. It's feeling poor. It's how we perceive ourselves and relate to each other. And if, if we're in this game of like, how do I, and this is the biggest thing I felt when I first met Panan. It's like, oh my God, there's a part of me that, that doesn't know how to behave here. It's like, because every other community that I'd ever been visited in my life, there was always a part of where do I fit in the pecking order? And then I went there and it just didn't even need to think about that. It was just wasn't, there was nothing to grapple with. Everyone was the same. I went to visit the Ben Jelly. You can meet them as well in the Tawai video. Um, and and I run around with the guys and it's like, and someone throws a stick out in front of us and we're pushing and pulling. And I was like, okay, we're going to have a tug of war, but there's no tug of war because it's like everyone that no one's trying to show anyone up. Everyone is like flexing their muscles and huffing and gruffing. And we're having a whale of a time all being super masculine, but there's no competition. Yeah. And it's like moments like that. It's like, Oh my God, you know, we train competition. It's another reason I don't want to send my kids to the school. It's like, you know, we need to we need to have your kids there so they can join the football team it's like no i don't want them to it's like i'm like okay so that's going to be a really hard one to get for most people to get their heads around really hard because it's so central to everything that we kind of love mm -hmm. but what's the cost look at our leaders saying we need to be competitive in the marketplace we need to be competitive with these other nations it's like well what's the cost ask the people struggling with the real cost of that competition now with the real cost of us putting other world leaders noses out of joint and seeing what happens then it's like that's what this leads to and those people knew it and that's that's it. and you can't separate them out it's like that's what it's about it's like that's what it's about and it took me a long time to really understand that but that's hard you know that's hard how are we going to recreate how are we going to put that genie back in the bowl you know it's, it's going to be question. difficult, but the first step is to know it's the solution, to believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like that competition, and that was kind of something I got from that film you shared. Um, it's like competition underneath that for me is fear, rather than what uh, Shechichin, the head teacher in that school, says, the biggest thing that I need to do, he says, is move them from fear, the children, into love. Mm. Whereas I feel most of our education systems, it's about fear. Mm. The city, it's about fear. You know? I see that still something I have to keep coming up against is my fear. Mm. It's like, oh, oh, yeah. Quiet. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we, you know, those, the, you know, the reason that I use the word to why in the film is the, you, you remember Jeffrey going into the forest. It's like, I feel to why when I come in the forest, it's like being at my mother's breast. Mm. 
It's like, I know that this forest will nourish me and look after me. It's like, that's a sense of trust. There's no fear there. Mm. We don't have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I could listen to you talk for an <laughs> hour or so. And we're wanting to draw this together. So any last words? And I'll put in the description how uh, people can reach out to to why to to watch the film and i do recommend um, mm. people watch it because it is a beautiful film and i've watched quite a few of the extras uh, some of the interviews and with the the ben jelly and yeah they're fascinating as well so any last things to share uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well that's sweet of you to ask uh no, it's like, I, I, well, maybe, um, you know, I, I, I can sound quite, I can sound quite uh, negative or even fear mongery sometimes, perhaps it's um, to, to, to some people. Um, but like, I think that what I really would like to end with is like uh, the reason that I have the, these, these thoughts so strongly is because I've seen how amazing we as a species are you know i believe in us i know that we can be in harmony i do genuinely believe it is our it, it's not our natural state it's very hard it's hard work but it's it's our most enjoyable state and it's our most resilient state and we can achieve this but we've got to get the word out we've got to reconnect with our ancient past and like and there's and we've got to really question and we've got to heal and it's going to be a tricky road and we're not all going to make it. Well, none of us are going to make it anyway, all the way. So it's like, you know, we're just going to do the best we can. But like, we've got to try to create something that's really beautiful for our kids and, and their kids. And, and so I do believe that there's something extraordinary that's possible for us. And yes, it's going to be, it's going to be a tricky road. And yes, it will feel like some sacrifices in the short term, but if we can believe that the long term benefits will be outweigh those small little sacrifices in the long run, then 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 there's a real chance, you know, and we've got to know that going on that healing journey and we've got to believe it and trust it is is beneficial in the long run for all the short term difficulties that might arise just got to believe all that and then there's real hope for us you know um so yeah i just want to i guess wanted to end by saying that for, for all of the you know the, the slight doom of my chat sometimes beneath that is this real love for us as a species and real hope and understanding and belief that we can do something and create something amazing and um that maybe that's a good tone to finish with mm -hmm yeah very beautiful belief and of knowing hope love so mm. uh, trust as well trust trust yeah thank you thank you yeah mm -hmm. i really i've really enjoyed our conversation today i feel i've learned a lot and yeah i've really it's that hope yeah that we can do this and we can get through this um, so thank you for you know all the work you've done and your amazing films and please do everybody please um go and watch that film uh to why and yeah um so thank you all right Piers. lots of love buddy nice to meet you man bye-bye